Uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the first of two events on urban resilience organized by Asia Society Switzerland and the Swiss Re Institute. Asia, as I'm sure you're all aware, is urbanizing at breathtaking speed. Of the 47 cities that are defined as megacities, meaning they have a population of more than 10 million people, two thirds are in Asia. The region is not as urbanized as Europe or North America yet. Roughly 82% of Americans and 74% of Europeans live in cities. But Asia, of course, is catching up fast with mammoth cities are sprawl and that are sprawling archipelagos spanning vast areas. Today, uh, we're going to talk about Asian cities and urban resilience um, in Asia. And I think it's a fitting topic for this collaboration between Asia Society Switzerland and Swiss Re. This is the third year that we are doing an event series like this, and it's always focused on um, on sustainability topics in Asia. Asia Society Switzerland, as I'm sure many of you know, um, is an independent nonprofit organization. Our focus is helping Switzerland develop Asia competence. And I think understanding how Asian cities develop and how they can become more resilient is a very important part of that. The UN right now puts the number of city dwellers in Asia at 2.3 billion. Um, a few years ago, um, Asia surpassed the 50% mark, so for the first time in history, more people in the region live in cities than do not. And we all have this image of the busy, crowded Asian cities, right? It's the famous mad dash scramble at the Shibuya pedestrian crossing in Tokyo, um, or the unending hyper-dense forest of sky-high apartment buildings in Hong Kong. But urbanization is not just happening in these uh, famous first-year metropolises, um, it's happening everywhere in places that many of us uh, will not even know. And, and one really striking number is uh, that Dhaka, the capital of Bangladesh, is growing by half a million residents a year. The fastest growth is expected um, in the region in second-tier cities in Indonesia, Vietnam, the Philippines, um, and Thailand. And I just want to put this Dhaka number in context. So. Uh, we are here in Zurich, and if you live in Zurich, and if you've lived in Zurich over the last few years, you will have read your share of articles um, in the news about the city growing and it becoming denser, you know, and this being a problem because it strains the infrastructure. So Zurich is growing by 1,600 people a year. Dhaka is growing by 500,000 people a year. So I think that comparison alone shows you just the scale difference um, that uh, we are talking about. And that, of course, leads to tremendous challenges. Um, the challenge to provide housing for that many new residents. They need roads and public transportation. Their kids need school. They need health care. Um, and all of this needs to grow in lockstep with population growth, which, again, it's slightly easier to manage if that is 1,600 people per year than when it's half a million. So this morning, we will look at some of Asia's fast growing cities um, and how they face the slow moving crises um, that we see. Uh, threats like overpopulation, um, which are very real and can bring a city to its knees. Um, good example is Jakarta, where um, the time that people and goods waste on the city's notoriously gridlocked road is estimated to cost the city 4 billion US dollars a year. Um, just imagine that. I'm sure some of you have actually spent time on Jakarta's gridlocked cities. Um, of course, the city is also sinking, um, which has led the Indonesian government and President Jokowi to actually develop a plan to move the capital away from Jakarta. Not everybody can do that. Most of Asia's megacities will have to face slow-moving stresses like gridlock, overpopulation, and climate change head-on. Uh, they can't just move away from it. Um, and of course, many of these cities are also governed by, let's say, not the most efficient of bureaucracies. Uh, Metro Manila is governed by 16 different local governments, and Jakarta, Greater Jakarta, consists of nine different administrative divisions. So today, uh, we'll talk about the slow-moving crisis. We'll start in the first part of today by uh, listening to three very short keynote speeches as a way of input, and then we'll move to a short break. Um, Oh, there's a slide here um, that tells you all about this. Um, we'll have a short break, then followed by a panel discussion. This would have been me, but you already know who I am. So let's move straight on to the first 
keynote session, uh, starting us off to talk about urban challenges and why it's necessary for them to manage their resilience in the face of all of them is Jonas Jürin, who is the co-director of the Future Resilient Systems Program, hosted by the ETH Center in Singapore, um, and has joined us here live in Zurich. Jonas, the floor is yours for 20 minutes. Thank you very much for inviting me for this uh, talk. Um, it's a pleasure speaking to you here live and also to the audience online. I will talk about four parts. One is about urban challenges. I will then talk a bit about the connection between the risk and resilience. And then also give a few examples of how we in Singapore in the future resilient systems program analyze resilience. And then I will conclude to talk with some of the opportunities for resilience management. Um, it has just been said by Nico, we are facing a difficult time in terms of urban population growth. This is just a map um, highlighting what we just heard before. More and more people will be living in urban environments. We expect about 70% in 2050, and a lot of this urbanization is going to take place in the Asian and African context. Um, the challenge is related to urbanizations, as just said before. This is an example from Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam. You have an accumulation of uh, development that takes place, so there's enormous economic opportunities, a lot of uh, pull factors that come out of uh, cities, so people settle there, develop uh, businesses, have opportunities to develop income. So there's a really good opportunity um, to grow and develop. On the other hand, there is also an increasing disconnection where the resources actually come from and where they are consumed. This is a challenge in terms of resilience. It is a challenge in terms of supply chain um, resilience. It's, it's a challenge in, in terms of connecting the individuals in city to the actual resources um, where they come from. And um, there are many examples in, in the context of uh, Asian cities where we see very little food security, for example, because there's no food being produced, so it has to come from outside. The same with water. Singapore, where I work, has to import water from Malaysia, so it requires a contract and it requires a deal between Malaysia and the Singapore government for something that is basic, water. But that's the reality. Um, so, so in the Asian context, when we look at uh, cities, and in this case Singapore, we are seeing a new phenomenon, which is really the accumulation of, um, of, of assets. We see, in this case, the downtown of Singapore. You see the old town, the Chinatown at the front, and at the back, the, the central business district. So you see, on a very small piece of land, enormous amount of uh, assets, public or private assets, that are being developed. We also can see in this context uh, there's a very high demand on infrastructure, services, water, transportation, electricity, uh, and so on. But we also see that in Singapore there is less and less green space. It used to be a tropical city. It used to be a, a place where people basically um, have a tropical environment with trees and animals and so on. But this has make it, made way to have um, an urban setting, and, and these developments also lead to an exposure, which in the face of a disruption, it could be a cyber attack, it could be an urban heat um, event, could become troublesome to provide the services at all times. So we need resilience, we need to manage the risk in high density urban areas. And if we cannot manage well, this is the result. Um, we face a lot of disasters in many different Asian cities, in this case uh, Kuala Lumpur. Um, the, the, the density, the, the, the limited infrastructure services that, that are there, the information that is often lacking on how to manage um, uh, natural hazards typically leads to these kind of events. So we need, again, resilience. So where does it come from? Um, here another example of, of what we talk about when we analyze risks. We have different types. We have known events. We have events that we can sort of foresee. A flood event in Singapore that happens very often um, is something that we, we can manage. We know this is happening. Um, the losses are not too high. But then there are extreme events which are very difficult to foresee how much they will cost, how much they will, they, they will damage. And if we cannot manage these events well, then we have a lot of uh, losses. 
In addition to that, we have more and more so-called unknown events or very complex type of um, disasters, which, we are, which are difficult to predict. predict. There is a difficult uh, trajectory, how much damage will be there, what is the loss potential. In crowded cities, we also need to make sure that individual citizens are happy that the well-being is there. There can be riots, there can be uh, events that we can just simply not model and predict. And another challenge that we are facing is um, often we would like to transfer the risk and maybe have insurance products that sort of take some of the, the risk away in order to financially compensate uh, losses. But a city has to plan for a very long term, 50 years, 100 years and so on. So it is often very difficult to understand the risk exposure, how it is changing over time. Um, and this is shown here that you have enormous amount of uncertainty. So if you can do adapt more, if you can mitigate the risk, maybe you can lower the risk exposure, but maybe not. And this is something that we would like to better understand. Um, so what is resilience? Let's come to the topic. Um, one definition, there are many definitions. This is by the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction. It's really about the ability of a system, a community or a society uh, which is exposed to hazards to basically resist, absorb, accommodate, adapt to, transform and recover. And in this context, from this uh, UN agency, it's all connected to how we manage risk but it's sort of a complementary approach to, to further evolve on how we manage our life, our system. So we need resilience. Um, it is a concept, it is not a theory, it is something where we, in this example, we think about a certain level of performance that we have, and it could be a system, it could be an individual, a society, but at some point of time there is a shock or there is sort of a disruption and our, <clears throat> our performance will drop down. And the question then is how quickly we can recover and how we can adapt. And what we are doing in our program is to understand these, um, these different parts of the, of the resilience uh, concept. How to, can we respond to it? How can we recover? And how can we learn? And we can quantify them. We can develop metrics to ba basically quantify how um, resilient a system can be, infrastructure system, an individual, and so on. This is what we are working on. And ultimately, the idea is to, to tell and forecast whether a system can sustain or whether it will collapse. Um, I mentioned before a bit about basic services and also about infrastructure systems, and this is an example, just a, a stylized example of um, what happens if you, if you have a potential attack or, or an accident in a city? It may disrupt, for example, uh, the roads in the nearby area. There might be congestion or there might be a, um, some other problem that relates to it. Um, but when we then talk about interdependencies, then it could be that not only the roads are affected, but also the, the power lines. And this is possible if you, for example, have an accident on a signal light and then maybe there's a blackout. So the power lines would be also affected. And if, if the power doesn't work, then it's possible that the water pumps don't work and so the water network um, is disrupted. And in dense locations, what we see in, in Asian cities, we have the challenge of interdependencies and we need to analyze them in order to develop a system of systems understanding. So let, let me go very quickly into, into a few examples of how we do this. And one example here <coughs> is, a, is a recent uh, model that uh, my colleagues developed. It's an integrated simulation model, computational model, where we can do a component and system <coughs> level analysis. We can understand the flows in different water, energy and, um, and road networks. We can understand the individual flows. Then we can also try to, to uh, predict the potential um, um, hazard events. We can, we can develop probabilities for that. We combine these different modules um, into one integrated model, which is, which is quite challenging computationally. And then at the end, we can develop different resilience metrics, estimate how much is a potential system affected and how fast it can recover. And now, Moving away from the abstract uh, presentation, here you can see what happens on the bottom left. Um, how is a potential 
flood event, that's the blue line, how is it affecting different lines, different components of a, of a, of a water or of a road network. And then you can see on the, on the top left how it impacts in terms of water and power supply. So this is Micropolis, this is a virtual city, this is a simulation, this is not yet validated. This is something that we just do now on the computer. The next step will be to really go into the field, see how a potential hazard event really cascades down, how the system responds to it, how quickly we can recover, which strategies are effective to restore the services in different um, infrastructure systems. Another example that we are doing in Singapore is to, to measure using sensors um, how urban heat um, is, is affecting us. So we are installing um, sensors in different parts, in different neighborhoods um, of the city, trying to understand the wind, trying to understand the temperature, trying to see how this could be different. So here we have this keyword, Internet of Things. It allows us to collect information in real time. It allows us to, to use this information to do um, um, modeling, multi-physics models are being applied, computational fluid dynamics is being used to basically then uh, determine in this example how much anthropogenic heat emissions are actually increasing the urban heat uh, in Singapore. We know very well that Singapore uses a lot of air conditioner. Air conditioner are needed because it's very hot in Singapore. The average temperature is around 27, 28 degrees in a year and on top of that we are adding more heat because we need air conditioner, air conditioner release heat. So we need to understand how this is um, changing and in this case we are trying to break it down to a scale of about um, 10 kilometers. We try to understand the, <coughs> the different flows that we have. Um, Here is the buoyancy effect. We can see the coupling and on how the heat that is trapped typically at the bottom of the streets, how much it goes up and how much um, heat is actually going out at night. And we can model this um, with, with the CFD models. <coughs> Another example, a new technology, I mean, it's not new, but it's being used increasingly it's using digital twin basically a, a representation of the physical reality. Um, in this case, in Singapore, we are trying to see what is the cooling load, what is the energy demand of buildings. We are doing this for the campus of the National University of Singapore, trying to see how occupancy, how, how much energy is being used for different scenarios during a pandemic, in the face of climate change, trying to see how much energy we really need, what is the intensity, and the digital twin technology allows us um, to do so. And I have a little demo here for you <coughs> to see basically how, sorry, oh, it doesn't work. It should click something, but I don't know if the video works. Um, okay, so maybe not. Oh. Maybe now. Trying to help you, a second. Yeah, now it's working. Great. Okay. So this is a study from the NUS campus. This is, um, <coughs> this is the, the demo or the app that we have. We can see the different buildings. The red buildings, they consume more um, electricity. They have higher cooling load, higher energy um, demand. The other buildings a bit less. We collect this, what I just mentioned, this building meter data. We can see in the context of how many people are in the building, whether we need more or less um, energy or electricity in, in, to supply, this, um, to, to supply the, the buildings. We are also looking at different types of um, buildings from having more office type of buildings, residential. We see different patterns in terms of energy demand and also electricity. Uh, use. <clears throat> uh, 
We can also look at different um, thematic areas within the campus. We can play around, we can inform people how it looks like in your campus. And then, most importantly, we can do forecast scenarios. In this case, we can look at um, which buildings may need more or less energy over the next 30 years. So this is using the city energy analyst uh, model. If you are interested, please have a look at this. But this is then, in, on top of that, a digital twin application. Um, let me conclude the talk with um, three more slides. Um, one is about where, where do we go next? We heard before um, there is digitalization happening. There's enormous potential to collect information. Singapore is at the forefront. There, there is an own department in the city government to just work on developing the city to become smart, distributed energy systems, a real-time collection of, of any sort of information among buildings, um, trying to see how infrastructure systems can perform um, as well as how people can be supplied with uh, critical information. If we want to build resilience, there are two components. One is to really have a physical improvement of the system, uh, infrastructure systems or others. The other one is really about communication and making sure people are aware of the situation in order to manage a potential um, disruption. And here we have one example where we, we are using eye tracking as a technology to see how people under stress situation, for example in control rooms, how they can actually uh, collect the information, analyze the information and then make the right decision in order to navigate through a crisis or through, for example, uh, traffic congestion, make the right communication, how we can improve um, and deal with a disrupted situation. These are ways of how we can enhance our sense-making capabilities and this is where we will go next. This is the last slide and I want to, I want to conclude here, this is Hong Kong, very high dense place in Asia. Um, I want to conclude with with three points. And one is really the technologies. This is available. We have technologies to, to, to detect, predict and manage ambiguous events and situations. I know it's abstract, but it's really these different components about how can we detect the potential disruption, how we can manage it and how we can be better prepared for the future. And how can we do that? This applies to organizations as well as to individuals. We need to regularly stress test. We need to apply different scenarios. It can be climate change, but it can also be a cyber attack or it can be any other uh, thing that you can think of. And finally, that's the last one. We need to develop uh, foresight um, capabilities. We need to be always prepared for an unexpected event. And this is required or this is happening if we develop resilience-oriented mindset. That's the end of the talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jonas. This was uh, quite a lot in a short amount of time. Very interesting. Thank you. I want to just quickly follow up on one point. And you started out by talking a lot about density. Now, I've been sort of taught to think of density in cities as a good thing, right? It's sort of people move into cities, it's sort of higher density, more density makes it more efficient, it's easier to access service and whatnot. But you also highlighted the, the risk inherent in density. Um, it leads to risk cascading, uh, it traps the heat. So is there something as like good or bad density? Can density be made better or worse depending on what kind of density it is? I, I, I don't think there is a good or bad density. I think that the question is how do we manage it? Mm. And typically the solution that urban planners do is to optimize. So mm. we try to have a dense built environment added with a bit of green space or, or water bodies or wh whatever you have. But you try to ventilate the cities, you try to make sure that this density doesn't reduce the well-being and the livability. But it is a real challenge and Singapore is really at the, at the very high end in terms of optimizing the green space as well as the density. Other cities like Ho Chi Minh City was a good example, or Jakarta is a very good example. If you take a satellite image from Jakarta, you will see barely any green space. Mm. And there you wonder if density is healthy. I Thank don't you think very so. much.
Okay, thank you very much, uh, Jonas Jürgen, and we'll, we'll hear again from you later um, in the panel discussion. But for now, it's time to move on to another uh, big Asian city, and that is Bangkok. And Bangkok has actually appointed a few years ago its first uh, chief resilience officer, um, and I'm very pleased to welcome, welcome him now to our event, Dr. Supachai Tantikam. Um, joining us directly from Bangkok. He was, um, as mentioned, the first chief resilience officer of Bangkok and developed the first resilience strategy for the city. And he will talk about um, what that entailed and how Bangkok um, is managing to become more resilient. Supachai, hello and welcome to Swiss Re and Asia Society Switzerland. Hello, can you hear me? We can, good morning. We, yes, good morning. We can hear you well. And I would hand right over to you for uh, your short keynote, and then we can follow up with some questions. So the floor is yours, and I think you also have some slides. Okay. Okay. So good morning, everybody. This is uh, Subchai from Bangkok. Okay. So uh, my topic is about uh, an urban resilient approach for Bangkok City. As you know, that Bangkok is, uh, has been joining the 100 resilient city uh, when they start to, to go moving for the resilient. And on the definition under 100 resilient city, the urban resilience is a capacity of individuals, community, institution, business, and system, everything in the city uh, that can survive, adapt, and grow no matter what kind of chronic stress and acute shock they experience. Because we have urbanization, uh, climate change, globalization. That's why we think that we need to have a resilient to make the urban resilience. Now, uh, 100 resilient city has developed what we call the city resilient framework, which is composed of four main segments under the health and well-being, uh, economy and society, infrastructure and environment, and leadership and strategy. So this resilient city framework help the city to uh, look at themselves, to evaluate what they need to do and what they already did good so they, they can develop and make the city more resilient. Okay. Now, let's talk about the city of Bangkok. Uh, Bangkok city is the capital city of Thailand. We have People register population, just mean people who register that they live in Bangkok, approximately 6 million. But we expect that we have about 12 million population in the city who live in the city. I mean, they, they come to work and they live in the city, but they, they don't move their name to the city. And that is the bad thing because we get the tax, the percent of the tax from the number of population. So we have to service over 12 million people, but we have only share about 6 million of the tax. And the Bangkok is about 1,600 1, square kilometer, and it is laying on flat plain near the mouth of the Chao Phraya River, which is the largest river in Thailand. Uh, the elevation of the city is about minus 0 0.5 means sea level to plus 2.5 means sea level at the north of the city and it go down to minus 0 0.5 because of in the past there are a lot of subsidence in the city and we generate about almost 10,000 tons a day of solid waste that the city has to take care. So in order to develop uh, the resident strategy uh, we are looking at the shock and stress. So the, the primary priority shock and stress for to, to develop. So the priority shock is the flooding. It's being flooding every year, small flood, big flood. So because Bangkok is below the sea level and in the flat plain. And earthquake, we, we don't, the bank, the city is not situated on the fault line but we can feel some checking when there are some quake in the Sumatra, uh, Indonesia, and or in Myanmar. So we can feel some check in the city. Uh, riot, city unrest. We used to go for the 
unrest, city unrest in the city between the red shirt and yellow shirt a few years ago, uh, economic crisis, traffic accident and fire incident are all the priority shocks. Now for chronic stress, the priority stress will be unemployment, poverty and inequality, traffic congestion. This is very important because every day we have a traffic congestion, driving to work one and a half hour to two hour, come back one to two hour, especially when there are flooding, it takes more time to go to work and, and come back home. Air quality is also another uh, stress that people facing, especially the PM 2.5 in the dry season and economic downturn. Now, uh, I'm emphasized on the flood because there's, there's so many things. Okay, Bangkok has been subject to big flood several times in the past. In 1942, 1983, 1995, 2011, and 2011 is the most, most flooding for, for the city, okay, especially in Thailand. The economic loss is more than 100,000 100, uh, million, right? It's a lot because uh, in the uh, business area, industrial zone, so this is the biggest flood. If you see that the flood happened almost at the plane. And this is the picture of the flooding in the Chao Phaya River. Fortunately, the water level is still below the dike along the river. We cannot imagine if the water in the river is above the dike then the whole city will be under water. And this is a map show. The blue is, is the water around the Bangkok. And in, in the city itself, it does have some big flood also. So this picture show the red, the red one show the evacuation area. So we ask people to evacuate to some area. Don't live in that area. And this zone has been flooded for months. For month, okay. And this this picture show you the flooding in this month, September 20th, 2022, This month, the flooding caused traffic problem. You see that the top corner the traffic problem, and this is uh, the underground tunnel, and so the water leak into the tunnel, and it's caused people cannot get home. You see the picture, people cannot get home. They don't have, they come by the uh, mass transit, but at the station, they, they cannot find any connection to the home. So it takes them three hours before they, they can arrive home from that area. So the flooding caused a lot of uh, trouble to people in the, living in Bangkok. This is also uh, the picture of the flooding in this month, September, due to the heavy rain. The flooding is different. This, this time is due to the heavy rain. Now, what is the cause of flooding in Bangkok? So we have a heavy rainfall in the city. The infrastructure system of the city has been designed for 60 millimeter per hour or the return period of a five year return period. But sometimes the rain is over 100 or 120 millimeter per hour. So the, the, the pipe cannot handle that. It takes a few hours before the water drain out. Sometimes it takes overnight. And the second cause is the high water level in the Chao Phaya River. Whenever they have a big, big rain in, in the north, so it will have a, a high water level because the Chao Phaya River catchment area is about one third of the country. So all the catchment and the water just pass through Bangkok and go to the sea. Land subsidence, as I mentioned that we have more than 60, 70 meter of land subsidence in the past. Right now, the uh, settlement is about uh, one or two, two centimeter a year because 
we don't allow to pump the underground water. Pumping underground water is the cause of the land subsidence because Bangkok is situated on the soft clay also. Insufficient drainage capacity, as I mentioned that Bangkok drainage has been designed for 60 millimeter per hour, 60 millimeter per hour. And sometimes the rain is quite heavy. So the drainage cannot uh, take it. Urbanization, okay. Uh, in the past, when Bangkok is flat, it doesn't cause any much damage because it does not have much urbanization. But at present, uh, people keep on developing high rise, building house, road. So less green area, then the water cannot go anywhere. They have to go under the pipe. Then this causing, causing the flooding. We call the uh, pluvial flood. Land use chain, as you see, it used to be farm in the past and now it become the city. Climate change, as I mentioned, we have a regular pattern of rain in the past and we can predict right now the land pattern change and more severe storm come. That's caused the uh, flooding. Another factor is the sea level rise in the Gulf of Thailand. The sea level will rise about four millimeters per year. And if you imagine with in next 50 years, Bangkok will be more trouble. Also, the next one is the socioeconomic development. So I mentioned before that Bangkok is at the mouth of the Chao Phraya River and the catchment area of the whole river is about one third of the country. The watershed area is about 160,000 square kilometer. So it causes the flow, the flow capacity of the Chao Phraya River pass when it passes through Bangkok is about 2,000 to 3,600 3, cubic meter per second. So when the flow is over this number, it's causing uh, some flooding in the city. Okay, and this graph shows you the accumulated rainfall. The red one is, is this year. You know, each year in Bangkok, it will be about two meters of rains, accumulated about two meters of rains. And the right-hand side shows you each month of the rain. If you look at the September, only 10 days of September is already half of the rainfall in the month. But the most important is, is the rainfall in the day. Because if you have a heavy rainfall in, in one day, like more than 100, then you cause a problem of, of the city. And this is the city planning. So Bangkok is divided into left side and the right side of the Chao Phraya River. And this is the Chao Phraya River. See, this city plan will be uh, revised every five years. The green area, the green color is the green area, which restrict for, for flood, flooding. So it's less strict of the development. The yellow is the residential area. Uh, red is a dense commercial, okay? And orange is uh, less dense and yellow is the regional area. And this uh, city planning will be changing at every five years. Now, the concept of doing them of the, uh, this is show when you have rain, water just go to the uh, pipe and then from the pipe, it go to canal. From, from the canal, you have to pump into the river because the water in the river is higher than the water in the canal. So you have to pump, you have to close the gate and pump. And we have a dike all around Bangkok to protect the water outside the Bangkok flow. So when you have a heavy rain in the city, this system works, water to the pipe, pipe to the canal, canal pump to the river. And this map, you will see that this is a Bangkok. So we, we have a wall along the river, along the river and both sides, Chao Phraya River, a wall 
to prevent the water overflow to the land. And we have some dike, some wall separate the Bangkok from other province. And we have this dike to, to separate the water. Don't let the water flow from this zone to this zone. That's why we have this one green color. So it's subject to be flat. And we protect, we protect the whole city from here. And in, inside, we have a system of canal and piping, also a tunneling. So we have dike for flood mitigation. We have dike along the river, right? We have drainage system, which was designed for five-year return period, 60 millimeter per hour. We have 1,000 Six, almost 1,700 canal, which is about 2.6 kilometer long. And we hope we have 6,400 6, kilometer long of drainage pipe. Okay, some in the main road, and some in the small road. We have 409 pumping stations. The total capacity is 1,690 cubic meter per second, which is huge. We have seven tunnel with a capacity of 155 cubic meter per second. We have 25 retention points and we have flood control center. So this is a picture of our, some of our pump station. Each pump is about three cubic meter per second. And this is a picture of the wall along the canal and the water gate. And this, this is the big canal. The diameter is about five meter. So the construction has to be used the uh, tunneling machine. So the concept is uh, uh, the inlet is, inlet is in the canal. So the way the water go through the tunnel and suction to the river, okay. The, actually, the, the system is good, but the problem is Bangkok is flat. Bangkok is flat. So the water in the canal flow, the flow rate is very slow, maybe 0 0.5 to 1 meter per second, the flow, the velocity. Uh, Sometimes you pump the water from one end, but the water cannot go through the pump fast enough. So you cannot run the pump or continue running. You have to wait until the water flow to, to the pump. And you see, uh, this is a dike along the river and canal. And after 2011 fact, this is the dike that used for the road. So we have to raise the dike because after a few years, this has take to be settled down a few centimeters, okay? And concrete barrier used to protect the water from one side to the other side, from left side to right side. So we have to protect. And dredging drained it canal. As I mentioned that the flow rate is really slow, the velocity is very slow. So there's a lot of sedimentation. So the canal will, will be uh, filled with uh, sediment. So we have to dredge the canal every year to let the water flow better. And our flood control center, so we have uh, meteorological data, we have hydrological data, facility status, flood damage data sent to the center analysis. So we have a uh, flood fighting team. We send the information to flood fighting team. We send to public announcement. We send all the information and, and we have a facility for operation. So in, in the center, uh, we have a lot of terminals, SCADA, SCADA. We have radar to radar to monitor the rain. Okay, we have 
uh, flood detector on the main road. We have water level sensor. Uh, we have pump operating sensor. So CCTV camera. So this is a picture show you uh, the sensor that we install on the on the footpath. It will send whenever it has a water level, the sensor will send signal to the center. And we have CCTV camera. We have the picture show the, the potential rainfall. And this is the monitoring system. And this is the uh, rainfall data, the SCADA, to pre forecast the rainfall in the city. OK, another problem is the uh, garbage. So you see a lot of uh, garbage in the canal. And this garbage will block the pump station. So that's another problem. Another problem is the encroaching in the, in the river. So these houses are illegal, but they live in, in the canal. So the government try to move them to the bank and try to build a house better for them to have a better life. So this is before that, after that. So, so they have a better life and they won't uh, uh, obstruct the flow of the water in the canal. Now, if you like, look at the whole Bangkok residence strategy, our goal is to have a safe, livable, and sustainable city. So in three strategic area, we want to increase the quality of life, reducing risk and increasing adaptation, and driving a strong and competitive economy. So the goal is to have a good health and well-being for our city residents. We have a safe, accessible, and convenient transportation network to have a better environmental friendly urbanization and to improve city flood resilience. That's why I already mentioned, increase public and community driving action on awareness, preparedness, and adaptation. We want to make a stronger institution capacity and regulation. And we want to facilitate city and community based economy and expanding tourism, service, industry, and hospitality. With this goal, we have uh, several, several uh, initiatives, which on the right hand, which I'm not going to talk about that because there's too many. Okay, so that's in my presentation. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you, Super Chai, so much. This was uh, very interesting. And I, I see just from that last slide, there would have been uh, so many other things to talk about. In the interest of time, um, I suggest we move right along. Super Chai will come back um, for the panel discussion later. So thank you very much for now to Bangkok, and I'll see you later. And it's my great pleasure now um, for the last keynote to welcome on stage Professor Dipjani Patacharya, who is the chair for the history of the Anthropocene at the University of Zurich. Are you, are you the first person to hold this chair? Yes, congratulations. It's what a fantastic, what a fantastic chair. Um, and she combines urban and environmental studies. And she will speak about urban resilience in the Bengal Delta surrounding her native Kolkata. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. It's very rare to have a historian talk about the future of the city. So I'm quite happy to be here talk a little bit about the past maybe also. Um, so what a time also to talk about rising waters. Like you've all heard the news coming out of Pakistan and Pakistan in some ways what's happening in, for instance, if you look at the city of Karachi, which was blistering under the heat last month, 42 degrees Celsius, 47 degrees Celsius, 118 degree Fahrenheit is now suffering not just from floods, but also from glacial melt and something maybe of interest to my Swiss colleagues here, Pakistan has the highest number of glaciers in the world and it is melting fast. So it, it, in some ways, what is going on, as a lot of us have pointed out, uh, I guess, a uh, lot, 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 lot of the, uh, ma, ma, the two of the speakers uh, pointed out is some of the cities that are threatened at the moment uh, are not only the densest cities in uh, in the world, but they are also the cities that are probably also uh, facing immense amount of land subsidence, Jakarta being the case, Calcutta, Bombay, Dhaka, Bangkok, these are all in some ways um, deltaic cities, but we have often forget forgotten the delta. So today what I want to think a little bit about Calcutta as um, uh, Nico pointed out, I've been working on Calcutta for a decade almost about in Calcutta and on the history of Calcutta and uh, one of the things I want to think about is 
uh, what happens when we think of cyclones now in the Bengal Delta, not as a sudden disaster, but a chronic stress. And this is a, this is a, a map from the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Agency in the United States. And you see the cyclonic landfall from 1830 through 2019. And uh, last year, when um, two years ago, when um, uh, Cyclone Amphan, which is considered the most expensive cyclone to have struck the northern Indian Ocean, 13 billion US dollars in damages, um, struck uh, right in May 2020. Uh, climate scientists like Adam Serbel, who's in um, uh, Colombia, as well as Roxy Cole, who's in India, both of them said this is a this is one of those compound events because of storm surge, because of atmospheric pressure, because of the rainfall that preceded and uh, succeeded it, as well as the massive, like the um, immense pressure. It was a massive disaster. There was a lot of coverage about what happened to Calcutta, but I want to place in this talk Calcutta a little bit, both in its history about what compounded the cyclonic effects, but also uh, how do we move forward and what are the what have, what have we learned and what are the mistakes we are making in spite of uh, um, what happened. So in some ways, I think for historians and social scientists, it is also a compound event because it pulled back the curtain and showed the mistakes we've made and what we are continuing to forget. And this uh, question of forgetting is something I actually wrote about in my uh, book, Empire and Ecology in the Bengal Delta. And I said, much of the problems of urban planning that I think both our speakers pointed out is, uh, or quite a bit of it, is premised on a particular kind of forgetting or particular kind of erasure of history. And something I often talk about with my policymaker friends and my friends who are working in the development sector or NGOs and planners in Calcutta. And they said, you are absolutely right, but we can't solve that problem. That We have to take it as an external. So I want to just put it out here. And I say, and, and I think this forgetting is very important to think about because it allows us to silo off certain kinds of knowledges to break down the problem and say we're going to address this because this is too difficult to address. And I think we have come to a juncture where we cannot do that in somewhere anymore. So what is, why am I talking about the Bengal Delta when we're talking about the city? I think it's important. These are two very one, it's an LSAT image as you can see and other is a, a picture and other is a very early map, but it shows what, what we see over here in, when we look at these two pictures, I will call them, because neither is that a map, no historians today read that as cartographic imagination, but you see the challenges of plotting the la la coastline, drawing a line between where land ends and where water begins. Here you see the silt actually floating into the water, and this is really, really important because the way we draw a line is central to the way we define property, the way we define landscape, the way we define banks, coastlines, and that has been a challenge for the longest time. In fact, I really like this. This is a census. Um, he was doing the um, uh, census of India at the time. He's very famous for writing this book, W.W. Uh, Hunter. And he said about Calcutta, when it flooded in 1937, is we have to understand this place because the perennial struggle between the earth and ocean goes on. And the, all the secrets of land making stand here to be like disclosed. And it is very important because there were voices. As, and I was, I think, telling Jonas at the beginning of the um, uh, event that there were constant voices throughout in saying the way we are proceeding with our knowledge is built upon often of temperate climate spaces, landscapes, temperate climate, river hydrology and things like that and then imposing into a tropical landscape we were making certain kinds of mistakes. How do we, un how do we build on landscapes that are mobile. And there were voices, but those voices were forgotten or were repressed. So I think it had, the time has come for us to take that kind of seriously. And it is very interesting, like when I started uh, uh, writing my book, I realized a lot of the histories about Calcutta exist from you know colo colonial triumphalist narrative to post-colonial histories. And they all talk about how this marsh was drained in to be made into a metropolis. And that was important. And of course, historians, when they, the way historians work, people like my breed, they often go to the archives, they take out the drainage report, they go to the municipal archive, they take out the drainage reports, they take out the topography, medical topographies, and then they write their histories. But imagine, as a thought experiment, if I said, if we were to write 100 years from now when this world is in a very cataclysmic state, if we were to write what we as humans did by looking at the IPCC reports we produced, we would make a mistake because there are those reports and then life goes on. Not, the reports are not having any kind of effect as, as we know. So that is one of the things, and I was, I, what I saw was 
while we've been writing how the city of Calcutta has been drained, we all know, and me growing up especially, know that city has not been drained. Every monsoon, every day when I returned from school during monsoon, I would have to wade through water. It was part of everyday life. We had particular special kinds of shoes to go to school during monsoon because we knew we had to wade through water. It was part of living with the water and somehow... We always thought of it as a fully built city where flood was a threat, where there were specific lines between the land and water, and the flood was a breach. And, you know, historians have been writing that this was a region that was very much flood dependent. It knew how to live with flood. And why has flood now become a threat in this region is something we have to think about and understand what were the forms of living in this area. So uh, how, then I started asking, how did we, what did we do if we didn't drain the city, if we produced reports, and we know always in post-colonial cities from, like, or at least sub subcontinental Indian cities from Karachi right up to Dhaka, governments produce report whenever there's a problem, municipal bodies get together and nobody follows this report. They completely get ignored. So I, was, I started asking, what exactly did we do? What I found very, very interestingly was in 1820, a small regulation was passed that became a law by 1881. And this had a critical, critical effect in the Bengal Delta. What that law was, was the law, how do, how do we regulate alluvian and diluvian? Uh, is basically what is understood as land formation and land subsidence. Since 1820, we've been worrying about it. And what that did was basically said in a mobile delta where tides define what land will look like during morning or these alluvial flats and what land will look like in the afternoon, depending on the tides, they decided how we take over the land. So the, at that time, the East India Company, which was ruling Calcutta, said, if the land is not fordable, which it often was in during uh, uh, high tide, the land belongs to the government. And so what, pre what was produced is all these lands, all of these various kinds of spaces got taken over as government lands where warehouses got built, where dogs got built, where offices got built, where roads got built. And when we go back and look at that, those are the lands that go underwater. And that also has had a post very strong post-colonial afterlife. What I'm showing you here are little snippets from the uh, bill as it was being scaled from the Bengal Delta, which is, as I think our previous speaker pointed, is a low-lying flat land uh, with a 90, m 90 meters of elevation from the sea level. They are trying to scale it up to make it for a law for the all of India. And these are kind of lawyers and hydrologists have sat together and projected uh, fictitious kind of imaginations of when the river moves and creates new land, how do we decide ownership and how do we take over that? Over and over again, whenever these revenue officials were sent off to decide whose land this new land formation was, they would be said, go during high tide because it would be non-fordable. And this is very, very important. Because what has happened in the post-colonial moment is anybody who develops this land is considered a land developer. It's literally the term, the land developer, which is a very, very important term, and is considered doing service to the government. So when in the 1920s and 30s there was a massive working class housing riots in, in all over India, they said Calcutta is suffering from a land famine because there is a river on one side and there are critical wetlands on the other side. They didn't use the word critical wetlands. They said marshes and bogs on the other side. And we need people who will come and invest and develop those lands. And, of course, a lot of cotton speculators and people who made money in cotton and opium, who had the money, went ahead developing this land. So this is Salt Lake, uh, a picture of Salt Lake uh, that you see from 1827. It's lakes, and it, you see this temporary market that used to be in the Salt Lakes. It was called the Salt Lake. In Calcutta, Salt Lake is a, one of the newly planned cities that was built in 1950s by the post-colonial government to manage the refugee population that had come from Bangladesh following or East Pakistan at that time following the partition of India. It is highly built up space, as you see, and it is supposed to be like the apple in the eye of Calcutta's planning history because it has, unlike most of Calcutta, which are circuitous uh, uh, roads, it is actually on a grid. Very few Indian cities are on a grid. It is on a grid. It is built on this critical, and it is actually now one of the 
high-end real estate areas of the city. It goes underwater every year. It was built by uh, overtaking these marshes and bogs, which were wasteland. And this is a mistake we have over and over again repeated. Uh, for instance, in the 1950s, Chennai had the similar problem, which is not a low-lying flat city, but it's a dry city. And Chennai was famous for these things called Aries in traditional, in Tamil. Aries are these kind of low-lying depression in the land, which people had to keep. These were grasslands, um, which which were often kept to collect monsoon water through the monsoon. So when there was a dry season came around in winter, people who were poor, who didn't have access to piped water and tanked water, had access to water. And, uh, and in the peri-urban area, the animal, pasture animals had access to water. In 1850, 1950s, when there was, World Bank came in to actually support a housing popular, like building working class housing in the city. They said, these are wasted land. We need, there is a land famine. The same term was used, that was used in the 1920s. We need to build up this land. And that land was built up. And that also broke down Chennai's relation to water because Chennai has since been suffering massive flooding every year, which cuts off the city from the water supply. But at the same time, Chennai has this, had this moment of like Cape Town ground zero moment of not having water two summers ago. So where do we go from here? What have we learned? What have we sort of learned from this? What is happening at the moment is two things are happening. Indians, like as, as both our speakers pointed out, Asian cities are fast urbanizing. Asian cities also want, at least Indian cities want to attract foreign capital. And what that means is they have to develop what are, they're calling satellite towns in every city. They're often for Bangalore, these are, the, these are called the IT, IT centers of the city. They are in the peri-urban area. They're taking over this agrarian land. And in the case of both Bangalore, Calcutta, Bombay, they are formed of formerly wetlands or recovered, reclaimed land from the sea. And the idea is the airport will be there. You do not have to go through the gridlocked um, um, center of the city, the older center of the city, which is full of congestion, doesn't have straight lines, doesn't have strong um, uh, wide lanes, but you can manage to bypass that congested city and just go straight from the city through high flyovers right into the IT centers, which is full of high-rise buildings. Some of them are leaning, and there are various kinds of IBM building in Calcutta is leaning, and it is called uh, India's Pisa, Calcutta's Pisa, because it, has, it is on a, on a swamp. And what, are, what that means is these, this is a 25-story building whose lifts do not work because you have a tilting building. So these are the problems we are facing because they're all built on kind of swamps. Golan Shannal, who's a political economist, he called India's urbanization a bypass urbanization, where you bypass not only the city's representative municipal government, then you can work with developers, because these are peri-urban areas where the governance, who actually controls it, is it district ma magistrates or, or the urban, you don't know, because you're extending the urban, but you're being able to bypass representative governance, but you're also bypassing the congestion and the gridlock. So this is where we stand. But then something else happen and why I said the uh, Ayla is very, very, Amphan and Ayla are very, very important. What Amphan showed us, and Amphan is like the seventh, 15th major cyclone to happen between 2007 and 2020. Um, when this cyclone happened, one of the things that the uh, um, um, planners and NGOs started saying is we need to basically do two things. We need to remove, and I think we heard a little bit about, we need to remove these huts who are basically built on these st um, th uh, streets in the little canals that have been left over in these areas. These huts are very important because this is where the service economy of these real estate um, high-rise high real estate is. These are places where maybe the uh, auto repair shops are, where your drivers are, where your gardeners are. So the city has not built enough public infrastructure to make sure the service economy of the agrarian population that, or the peri-urban population that has been displaced has a place to go. As a result, they are uh, over here. So they, they are being considered now encroachers, although Maybe in the initial phase, the city's urban uh, town planning government encroached upon the wetlands. So they're trying to remove that. But they've also said the mangrove, and here the delta becomes really, really important. The mangrove, the Sundarban Delta, is extraordinarily important. Of course, it is a UNESCO heritage center for its biodiversity and for its tiger, but also now as a carbon sink and a shock absorption. And which is all true, and here I talk about the siloing of knowledge, but this is also a mangrove with a 5 million population. And one of the plans that is now circulating is how do we plan a managed or a planned retreat of this population? 
And one of the things we are realizing is uh, if we start doing a planned retreat, some of the villages, mangrove dwellers are saying, I don't mind going elsewhere. We do need to move. But I don't want to move to the polluted air of Calcutta because I don't want to deal, deal with in urban Indian pollution. And we do not have an answer to that. That's one problem. The second problem is in 2009, a very major cyclone happened in Isla and the World Bank at that point put in $50 billion to bring, uh, build state-of-the-art embankment in the uh, um, uh, delta. And as, 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 uh, as our previous speaker pointed, this, is, this space is built on low, uh, very uh, soft clay. And these massive um, um, embankments cracked during Amphan. And that meant two things happened as a result of the cracking, uh, which, was, uh, which, of course, the, we were not ex expected. Because the city was completely cut away, the earth-moving vehicles that you need to fix the embankments could not reach there for at least a week or more, sometimes even 11 days. And saline water entered the agrarian fields and completely salinated the fields, rendering it useless in some ways. And what the people of the Delta are saying, we have been building uh, embankments in this region, mud embankments in this region from 1790s, 1780s, then when we settled this area, embankments are the lifeline over here. But when you take away our mud embankments and put concrete embankments, you take away our ability to repair our own embankments. And we, are, we become dependent on this kind of a rent economy where we have to pay uh, municipal, public, public developments workers to come from Calcutta with the JCB machine to basically fix it. So he, I will end here and say these, there are multiple kinds of problems and over and over again one of the things I've seen in my work is the building nexus, the cement lobby from the 1920s, the, uh, the speculators who need to invest have been very, very involved in deciding and funding where, uh, where this development agenda goes. And this is a question that we do not know how to address. And this is something I think we need to talk about. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Professor Bhattacharya. The perennial struggle between earth and ocean, I think, is a beautiful sort of image and very fitting for all the three of the presentations we've heard today. And I think the other the big thing to take away into the coffee break is really the the mind-boggling complexity of these issues and how the interdependencies sort of always mean that if you're trying to fix one problem, mm. you may actually um, end up creating another. So it is, um, in, in, this, uh, in, in this real sense, a, a very complex issue. Thank you all um, for sharing your insights with us. We're Thanks. now going to, um, we're moving into the panel discussion. Joining me here for the panel are uh, Jonas Jürgen and, of course, also Supachai uh, Tantikom from Bangkok, whom you've already heard of. And additionally, also next to Jonas, Jan Bieser, who is a senior researcher at the Gottlieb Duttweiler Institute, focusing on the opportunities and risks of digitalization for society and the environment. And then to my right, uh, Gary Lemke, who is the head of product management at Swiss Re Public Sector Solutions, which focuses on providing insurance to governments, NGOs, and other public sector entities. And before we move into discussion, I want to give both Jan and Gary the opportunity to um, uh, say a few words uh, for the <coughs> introduction. Um, I do want to remind everybody joining us online that if you have questions to any of the panelists, you can please submit them through Slido. Um, scan this QR code or go to slido.com and enter the code ASIA2022. If you're joining us here in the audience, uh, we also have a live microphone, so you can ask questions directly. Just um, raise your hand when we, when we get there. With that, um, Gary, I want to start with you. You work for Swiss Re and you ensure uh, governments and NGOs. And it seems to me from everything we've heard this morning that ensuring a large Asian megacity sounds like a nightmare. How is that even possible? Like, that, do you want to do that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, though, first of all, thank you very much for, for having me for this, for this panel today. Um, great morning so far. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, yeah, first of all, I mean, public sector solution at Swiss Re, I mean, since 2011, uh, we formed the unit, which by now still is the, the largest dedicated unit in the insurance industry with around 50 plus people with uh, exclusive focus on, uh, on the public sector. I mean, sovereign, sub sovereigns municipalities, state-owned enterprises uh, to help uh, those entities to, to close the, the protection gap. Um, though if, if we were not fascinated uh, about doing this, we would not be doing it for now 10 years plus, right? And maybe just, just uh, four, four, four quick aspects, so why, why and how, I mean, our, our industry helps, because at, at first glance it might not be totally obvious um, what, what we do and, and how, we, how we get involved. The first aspect really is, is around data and data services. I mean, we are very much data hungry. 
um, and we, we operate and, and support, provide and deal a lot also with, with data and technology. So you, you, you pressed a lot of buttons for us, right? I mean, ideas like the risk digital twins is, is very important for us. I mean, to have the ability to analyze uh, an urban environment, uh, a city area, to basically figure out what I call what's the Achilles heel of the system. Because if you have funds to invest, you want to invest the funds where there is the biggest bang for the buck, so to speak, where the biggest positive outcome is for the money you, you do invest. And you can only do this if you have these systems in place. And you gave a great example. Um, um, there might be, might be a, a simple car accident bumping into a transformer station, and all of a sudden there is no clean water any longer, right? And you have to understand this to really know, I mean, where, where to intervene. And, and our, our industry is, is very much in, into this. And, and one good example also, um, not as sophisticated as, as risk digital twins, but if, if, you, if you look this up, it's, it's around these uh, economics of climate adaptation, right? A study with partners and the technology we, we came up a couple of years back. We really tried to find out where's the sweet spot for mitigation, adaptation, and where, where's the spot where insurance should come into, uh, come in, come into play. Um, the second thing really is on, on actual product innovation. Even ours is a very old and traditional type of industry, and a lot might think we are very much slow moving, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, quite the contrary, right? Using, again, data, satellite technology to come up with new, let's say, products for, for flood prevention, uh, flood insurance products. There's a lot of talk about so-called parametrics or index-based insurance where you can use sensor data uh, to use those data information as a trigger uh, to come up with new insurance solutions, especially in urban environments where then um, you have fast, quick payouts possible. You can use the funds as discretionary use, uh, but also you can come up with, with ideas to, to provide protection for something which used to be historically not protectable on insurance schemes like this. Uh, non-damaged business uh, interruption, contingent, uh, contingency covers, or, I mean, if you look into the climate area, to then also cover for what we call transition risk, right? If you want to go from one technology into a new one, there's an extra risk involved, and you want to have coverage for that, but it's also an area where we are very much involved. Then the third one, um, establishing partnerships. I mean, you can't do this alone. I mean, public sector solutions, working with the public sector, with the private sector, but also working a lot with the development banks. I mean, that's, for example, with the KFW, the ADB, the World Bank, and, and, and others. And those institutions, for example, the ADB with her program on, on uh, green economic recovery after COVID-19, to really work with them to look into novel uh, ways to, to finance, to innovate, uh, and to, to help these products to get off the ground. And last but not least, and that might be really the most hidden aspect, is if you think about it, uh, globally, the insurance industry has about 30 trillion US dollars of assets under management. And it's, it's a very deliberate choice where and how you invest these assets. In which type of industry segments do you invest? Uh, do you invest into efforts to build back better? This is all ways where you can actively steer uh, as a company, uh, what, as an industry, what you want to do. And for example, Swiss Re, we started in 2019 uh, to, uh, to shift our asset portfolio uh, under, and out of, out of the, the general pools, if you will, into the bucket, which is truly uh, compliant with ESG. And now, basically, 2022, uh, almost all of our assets, I mean, 130 uh, billion US dollars, are fully ESG compliant. Again, there is a choice as an industry we can make um, to help all the efforts. Uh, we spoke about this this morning. So that, that's four short points. I think more details about the fascination and what we might be doing more in detail uh, when we come into the Q&A. Thank you very much, Gary. Um, you mentioned uh, um, at the beginning the role of technology. We've also heard it, of course, this morning from Jonas. And it seems to me, when I listen to both of you, that you know, very often technology is, is part of the solution. It's how we can assess the risk, measure the risk, mitigate the risk, manage the risk. So let me ask you this, Jan. Is there also a technology risk? Is technology threatening urban resilience in certain ways, or technology is just unambiguously good? Um, definitely, it's a, it's a really good question because definitely technology in the end of the day, you have often heard it is a tool you can do many things with and you can use it for, for different purposes. Briefly talking about the opportunities, we heard a lot of the opportunities we can use digital technology for increasing resilience this morning already. I think the, there were really, really many good examples about how the data, digital data helps us to create or to plan in a better way to create what-if scenarios in order to enhance our planning and our foresight. I think there are one or two additional things where we can utilize, what we can utilize digital technology for. It's basically doing more with less or with the same infrastructure which is there already by 
increasing the utilization of infra infrastructure, for example, in, in transport, if I, if, I, if I monitor my traffic flows and if I steer them in an intelligent way, I can put more people maybe on the same streets. If I would have a city where there's a lot of car usage, I could use mobility services in order to incentivize a change from very space inefficient cars to more space efficient public transport. These are things I can do with technology um, on top of advancing planning. However, technology by itself will, in my opinion, not do the change. It always needs to be technology plus policy on the one side. Um, if you think, for example, about home office to avoid commuting, which is not only a burden for time, which is a burden for congestion and for, for, for climate change as well. The technology was there basically before the pandemic already, um, but, but home office didn't really hit off um, it needed like social distancing and, and forcing people to stay at home um, in order to, to, to really avoid commuting on a larger scale. Um, so these are all the good things, but we need the policy with the technology and in terms of risks, certainly there are, there, there are several risks. On the first hand, technology is another infrastructure we're building up. And if this infrastructure fails, and the more dependent I'm on this infrastructure, um, the, more, the more vulnerable I'm on additional risks, basically. I mean, I, I only know some examples from my own life in Switzerland when the, the data centers of the payment service providers here in Switzerland failed, and it happened a couple of times. Nobody can suddenly pay anymore. It's not, not possible for the entire nation, basically. I think we have two payment providers in Switzerland who manage all the payments. So the ones who were, were with um, the one bank, they could still pay and had to pay for everybody. <laughs> but yeah, that's, an, that's another risk. And the other risk is that um, in terms of slow moving threats, I believe there's often the notion that, or like what, what a lot of the digital industry I think tells us is that if we just make it digital, it's more sustainable <laughs> and it's more environmentally friendly. And I have the feeling at least our research and research of other people indicates that so far uh, the use of digital technologies is more aggravating. For example, climate change is leading rather a little bit to more greenhouse gas emissions than less because it's mainly a driver of growth which um, and growth is coupled to resource use and greenhouse gas emissions yet and the potentials as said earlier are not really exploited systematically or through the right policies like there's a large potential digital technologies provide new opportunities and i can exploit them with the right policies in combination but this is not done um, sufficiently yet yeah thank you and i really i, mm. I think you make a really important pointer that technology very often can be part of the solution, but it's also adding on yet another la layer of complexity, building more systems that, you know, if they fail, can, can create cascading um, effects. Today we heard in the morning already a lot about uh, flooding and a lot about water, be it in, in, in Pakistan, be it in India, be it, of course, in, in Bangkok. And in this context, um, there's an interesting quote by an Indian urban planner that I wanted to share who said, heavy rainfall is not the only reason for urban flooding. It is bad infrastructure design. It is roads that bar water flow. It is the bad design of the storm water network. It is the ignoring of all uh, system that is severely underdeveloped, end quote. Um, Super Chaitanticom, you've uh, spent a lot of time looking, of course, at the, the, the flood risks in, in Bangkok and how they can be managed. From your perspective, would you agree with the statement is bad infrastructure design neglecting the system a key part of the reason why we see increased flooding and if yes what for you would be some of the key measures we could take to at least reduce the risk of flooding um, in cities like Bangkok yes uh, I do agree with you that uh, bad design in bad infrastructure design causing the problem with flooding but uh, you have to uh, remember that when, when we design, we design only a short return period, five-year return period. Okay. For example, in case of Bangkok, it's the 60 millimeter per hour. But uh, that's for economic, economic point of view. But in fact, with the climate change, the rain is stronger. So the, the 60 millimeter per hour is okay in that time but right now the the climate change the rain is heavy so it, it's not sufficient for today so not we cannot blame only bad design we have to blame the climate change also mm -hmm. you know people doesn't know that the the pattern will change right 
when we are in school, this is the textbooks teach us that okay, return period of five years is is the best for a uh, strong drainage, and that that's the op optimum. So so I I do agree that once once design, it cannot last long. Mm -hmm. I mean, one one time when you design in the past, it worked, but when you have a more urbanization, when you have climate change, it doesn't work. It doesn't mean that it's bad design, but with the information at information at that time, you have to do this. You're not going to design 200 millimeter per hour because you cannot prove that it worked for, for the investment, right? Mm. So then, then uh, the resilient, then we have to adjust for time. It's, it's moving. It's not what you do one thing, the infrastructure is rigid. You have to keep on moving and adapt for, for, for the future. Thank you. So, so that's what my opinion. Thank you very much. And, and I, I think there's a key point there, Jonas, that I, want, that I wanted to ask you about. So obviously, you know, part of this is bad infrastructure design and the very obvious solution is to build better infrastructure. But the, the issue we have in many of these cities is that the bad infrastructure has already been built and removing it entirely and building new one just because the, um, the circumstance of change is not necessarily uh, an option. So what's your view of, from a resilience point of view? How can we make existing infrastructure more resilient? How can we adapt the infrastructure to be better, um, barring just ripping it out completely and rebuilding it from scratch, which very often is too costly, too time consuming and, and, and just not feasible? I try to answer part of the question. Um, we are using technology to really analyze and assess the current condition of the infrastructure. And, and I give you another example. We are using drone technology nowadays to fly around the city to measure the condition of buildings. And it, we can detect cracks, we can see potential uh, issues that could arise. And this is especially done for historical or old infrastructure or buildings. So this, this is a way that we can use technology to assess the condition of the city. That's one part. The other part is how do we optimize the existing infrastructure. And I think what I give an example, a few cities now have, re in Asia especially, they have ad adopted uh, one-way lanes, for example. In the past, it was always two lanes in narrow streets, and you just basically try to, to, to change a bit the planning and, and try to optimize. But this is very incremental. We need to consider a transformation. We need to consider which parts of the infrastructure system can be preserved. And Zurich is a good example with re planning to reduce the speed limits to 30 km per hour. Maybe we need to do the same also in, in some of the Asian cities. I, I live on a busy road with three lanes. The speed limit is 70 and it's uh, in the city center. So we, are, we need to think about the well-being aspects. Mm. We need to think about how we can ensure the livability is upheld without destroying the old infrastructure. Try to live with it, and um, that would be my way to go. Yeah, if, if I may allow you to build on that, because I, I think we always consider infrastructure as being static, which I think is simply not true. I mean, I think you can go in any city in the world. I mean, it's, it's amazing at which speeds the entire city, all the building stock actually is transforming. Individual, individual buildings being, being replaced, shops being refurbished, uh, insulation being put on these buildings. And there is a notion in our industry which calls build back better. So if you make it mandatory that each time you do something small, you build back better to the best possible standards, I mean, over a relatively short period of time, you result in a significantly hardened infrastructure, most likely without even noticing this un un until you fly over with, with your drone. So I, I just want to make sure that uh, because, because infrastructure always is you know, super static, I mean, it's there for 70 years, nothing is going to change, which, which I think is, is not holding true in a way. And, and I like this, I thought, especially because it, it can also initiate actions from each individual one, each individual property or house owner can, can just to, to admit to the standard of, of building, building back better. And, and that, that will have a great deal of an, of an impact at a bearable cost then ultimately for the for the economy and for the society i do want to these are all like very big and complex questions but i think it's just the nature of the topics so i'm asking you all these broad questions and then you have to give a short pity answer in, in a few minutes which is it's challenging 
But one thing that also struck me this morning when, when I listened to all of you, and, and, and Debjani also said this in her presentation, is this, there's, a, there's almost a trade-off right, between making the cities more resilient, but then also having sort of population growth within the city. And in all these cities, we've heard it, um, are still growing, and they're growing at, at, at breakneck paces. At the same time, we're trying to adapt the infrastructure. We're trying to build back better. We're trying to do flood mitigation. Um, but at the same time, there's also, Jonas talked about well-being, so there's, there's an argument to be made that people should be able to move into cities because cities um, uh, promise economic well-being, promise prosperity. There's a reason all these people want to move into the city. So um, again, Super China in, in, in Bangkok, you, you, you live this problem, I assume, every day. You know, how do you think about the trade-off between sort of fortifying the city to allow it to withstand flooding, to withstand all the, uh, the, the increasing effects of climate change, but also allowing it to grow and, and, and allowing more people to sort of partake in the benefits that a city uh, economically offers. Is, there, is that even a trade-off or is the way to do both at the same time? So I think uh, it's up to the people we have to do more than because we cannot force the people not moving to the city, right? Because the city has uh, provide their opportunity, work, uh, better living. So everybody want to come to Bangkok for a better study, better school, uh, better living. Then it's causing more problem, of course. So that's that's the 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 task that the the city operator has to solve and to do the best for the people. But if you can build another city with a better uh, living better school and better work, then I'm sure that people will not move into to the Bangkok. But unfortunately for Thailand, because the second city, which is a, a larger, smaller Bangkok, is only 2 million people. And everybody want to move to the city because we have a great university, right? We have opportunity to do anything. We have opportunity to grow and uh, everything, shopping, industrial, everything, you, you name it. So I think that that's not the right way to develop the country. So the uh, Bangkok is everything in Thailand. When you are kid in, in Thailand, so your dream is once you go to school, you want to study in Bangkok. So I think we have to change this mindset and we, we have to develop uh, several cities which has equal or better opportunity and better living standard. So people can live over there and work over there. They don't have to move into Bangkok. Even the government invest a lot of billion to build the mass transit system. So they, they use tax which collect from the whole country, from the whole country, and just emphasize on the Bangkok. They built uh, 100 kilometer of subway. See, because they are not thinking to limit limit the people moving to Bangkok. Mm. Then, uh, in terms of Bangkok, then we have to to service, do the service. So we cannot force people not to to come to Bangkok because Bangkok is everything. The so that, that's my, my yeah. comment. Thank you, Jan. Quick comment? Just that uh, I want to say that I, I really agree with the statement um, in effect that from the discussions today, I have the feeling that we have this environment which is cr creating more and more pressure on cities, more people, climate change, so more um, higher risks of recurring flooding of heat waves and so on. And that we have a lot of excellent solutions or I imagine it like that the pressure is increasing on cities, like on a tube in a, in a car or in a cycle. And we have a lot of incredible solutions to let a little bit air out here, to let a little bit air out there, um, to decrease the pressure through technology, for example, through flood management systems and so on. But still, as we heard also this morning, a city has to plan for 50, for 80, for 100 years ahead. And is there sometimes a question being asked? And I don't know, I just, just want to raise the question. Will it be actually feasible to live in the city in 100 years again? And we talked a little bit before actually this event today. Um, will it actually be, still be feasible? Um, 
for anyone or for how many pe people will it be feasible and how do we manage for um, alternative solutions which are beyond the scope of the city? I'm wondering, um, and I don't know the answer, but if this should be incorporated in the medium to long-term plans as well. Thank you, and, and we will definitely come back sort of to this most existential question of all, so, you know, should we even live in cities? Uh, but for now, let's assume that we are, because we do, and, 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 um, and, and we need to deal with it. And I think we, we haven't really focused yet on one aspect of, of, of today's topic too much. The title already said, you know, we're talking about slow-moving crises. And, of course, the problem if the crisis is slow-moving is that there's always a faster-moving crisis that you need to address first. And it, it feels like many cities um, you know, are also financially restricted, so there's the risk that they always um, just address the, 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 the problem in front of them at hand um, and they fail to, as, as Jan has said, you know, plan 50, 80, um, 100 years ahead, um, you know, which would be necessary to, to build infrastructure. Gary, um, you know, as, a, as, as a representative of, of, of Swiss Re, um, what solutions are there to sort of fill this infrastructure investment gap in, in the long term that we, that we certainly see in, in, in many cities? How can we ensure cities have uh, both the financial and, and, and other resources to think long term, but also make these long term investments when they're busy at the same time, kind of like basically putting out the fire or trying to stop the flood uh, that's literally at their gates? Yeah, I think that's a multi-million dollar question, right? And there is certainly not, not one, one, one answer. I mean, one statement I also want, want to make, I mean, this, this, this is about resiliency and there's a great deal of focus on adaptation, but I think it's very important that we do not make adaptation the new mitigation, right? I think both have really to go hand in hand because adaptation ultimately is really reacting to something rather short term in a way. I mean, it's almost like the physical defense of something happening, but we, we should not forget really fighting the root cause, right? And, and it's just, just because I think it's, it's very important for, for me and I think also for the, for the overall, I mean, progress of, of, of the theme. To, to respond to your question, I think that the first, and it cannot be avoided, is, is data and, and, and information. And not only from, 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 from scientists, but we also spoke about during the break. I mean, it's, it's incredible how much data and information actually is available in Bangkok, in Thailand. <clears throat> I, I was running a project for the Asian Development Bank in, in the Philippines, in Vietnam, in Indonesia, and, and being in these MET offices, I mean, in these engineering offices, there is an enormous amount of data available, but it's very hard to put these data together because these governments are run by, by 16 different sub-governments, sub et cetera, et cetera. So just getting the information together would be, would be very powerful because there is only a limited amount of funds to be invested in, in helping the situation. And you really need to figure out, I mean, where, to my earlier point of view, where's Achilles heel of the system, where, where to invest. Um, then clearly public-private partnerships, because sometimes, I mean, there's just the, the look, okay, the, the private industry should help you, right? We just have to, have to attract, I mean, um, <clears throat> third-party capital. Third-party capital is, is very happy to, to, to support and to pull in, in in great amounts. Uh, but third car party capital is also a little shy of, of, of taking, I mean, unwanted risks. This is one thing where, where, where the insurance industry can step in. As I said, we can, we can help with solutions to cover for transition and risk, to de-risk certain construction, uh, to provide liability coverage for, for novel new technology where we're not quite sure yet or where the market's not quite sure if, if they should be working. At the same time, the government itself, I mean, can, can help to provide maybe backstops or tax levies or we can foster, I mean, novel financial instruments let's, uh, like, for example, um, uh, outcome, outcome bonds, right, where you really, I mean, you attract the capital and, and you, you, pay, you pay back the credits, you pay back uh, an extra coupon uh, if the outcome is being successful, uh, though the government is basically only on the hook once the project is successful, um, <clears throat> et cetera. Though there is a lot of novel, novel technology, also finance technology out there, and in this particular context, especially the development banks like the, the ADB, the Asian Development Bank, with their program on, on, the, on the green economic recovery, but also many other of these development banks are a great supporter and, and great in planting the seeds and providing the structure to allow for that. Though, long story short, I mean, in the combination of public-private partnerships, bringing these parties together, unlocking the data available, and, and, and trying out some of these, these novel uh, financial instruments. On this last point, sometimes that might be my very private view, we, we, we think too big. Uh, we want to solve the entire problem at once. 
and though we, we, we are stuck in thinking <laughs> and, and we never ever move to the, to the status of, of doing. And, and sometimes having, having the bravery to, to try out small scale projects, to experiment, there is something we're trying also in the Kochi canals uh, in, in, in India, which is, which is about canal restoration. But it's a very small pilot to see, okay, do we have the technology, does it work? I mean, it, it, are there the financial benefits? And once that small scale pilot actually works, we have a proof point we can build on and we can replicate. So, I mean, sometimes, I mean, starting smaller, if you say, look, it, what, what does that do? It's too small to be effective. But the most powerful thing also to, again, attract other third-party capitalists, we can point to an actual project, which is not theory, but it's out there working. And I, I saw Jonas has raised his hand, and, and I want to come back to it, but I do want to quickly follow up um, with you, Gary, on something. It's a, it's a point that it, it's something I often think about when, when I talk to people um, who, who work for Swiss Re. So I think of you guys as an insurance company or a reinsurance company, but here you are telling me um, you know, how you sort of have on the ground hands-on projects in, in, in the Kochi Canal, many other things. So there seems to be almost a bit of a blurring of the lines between sort of the kind of like my probably naive idea of how an insurance company works is sort of there to provide sort of hands-off insurance product, but you actually sort of going out there makes sense for you as a company to go out there and, and build things in a way. And, and I was just wondering whether you could talk a little bit about sort of how you think about that. So what's, what, how does the decision work for Swiss Re to go and actually do something versus just insure it? I mean, yes, I mean, building, yes, we have community days and we build things like, like avalanche defenses, but we don't build canals, right? No, but, but ultimately all the industry, especially the reinsurance industry, is, is about, I mean, understanding the risk. I mean, we can only take, take on these large tropical cyclone risk, urban risks, I mean, if, if we have a very, very deep understanding of the risk. And we also spoke about it. I mean, the majority of the employees in this firm, like myself, I'm, I'm an atmospheric physicist. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not a finance person. I mean, the majority of the folks in this organization have, have technical backgrounds, medical doctors, are experts in diabetes, are et cetera, et cetera. So to develop a deep understanding of the risk, we have the Swiss Re Institute <coughs> in, in Swiss Re to invest into this research, to build those markets, and also to provide the basis for our industry in the future. Because going back to your topic of slow onset risk, if, if we know the island is sinking, if, if we know, I mean, Manila is sinking, our markets are sinking. It's, it's banal. We, we, we like our business. We want to stay in the business. We want to, we want to, want to make sure it comes to a sustainable long-term model. And this strictly involves I mean, investing and knowing about the adaptation mechanisms un unless we do that. I mean, this is, there is no future, not for the cities and not for us, to be very open. Um, yeah, I wanted to compliment on all these points which I truly share and maybe as an outsider, the Swiss has a challenge. The protection gap is not closing. So we need other solutions on top of the insurance products. I think, but going back to the data part, um, I think we need to recognize that cities in Asia are rapidly transforming it as we speak. And when we had a recently a project with the World Bank in Ho Chi Minh City, and when we started in 2019, we went to the city authorities and they gave us paper documents with the plans of the road network and all this. And it wasn't in a digital format. But three years later, it is in a digital format. So, so these things are rapidly changing and more sensors are being mounted on different parts of the city to collect information. I think the information that is being created as we speak, is very valuable to understand the risk exposure, but also to forecast potential um, disruptions from happening. So this helps to build uh, resilience, but without a, a good understanding of the data, without being able to digest the rich information, we cannot make sense of the complexity of these cities. So we need to invest much more into our sense-making capabilities. We need to be able to make an understanding and a sense of ambiguous situation. We are not dealing with only one type of flood event or we are not only dealing with one type of natural hazard. We need to be prepared for a, a food crisis that we have in because of the Ukraine. We, we have an energy crisis. Uh, we have inflation problem. In Singapore the inflation is up to 4%. Uh, we have a housing problem. We have density problem, we are having multiple hazards at the same time and the information that we can collect needs to respond to that, that we can be 
resilient and for the future. I want to follow up uh, also on something Jan at the very beginning say, said the magic word, at least to me, which is policy. And I think that's something we should talk about as well. So, uh, you know, just maybe start, start with you um, in your presentation. Um, you showed all these wonderful tools that you and your colleagues have built, um, the digital twins. So you have all this data and you can, you can model the risk, you can analyze the risk, and that's all great. But I think, you know, it's, it's not helping unless then it also will affect the decision-making process in, in the policy-making process in the city. So how does that, in, in these concrete examples, really work? Like, how do you ensure that all the insights that you generate actually feed into decision-making in Singapore at the appropriate levels? That's probably not an easy thing to do, right? Um, short answer, we are collaborating with the local agencies. So there is a connection between what we do in science and what then maybe the policy side or the authorities can use. So we are using user-centric um, visualization platforms that allow to actually see and play with these results. And I think that's what offices in cities need right now. They need platforms, tools, where they can see how a, a potential disruption changes and they need to have these geospatial animations that allow them to see which part of the city is somehow changing. This is how we can contribute. But the decision-making process ultimately at the policy level is not in the hands of a scientist. It is really in the hands of the authorities. Uh, government people will make the decision. We provide information as good as we can, but it's not our job to do that. Jan, because you, you, you brought up this point yourself earlier, any, any, any insights? What can, so how, can, how does policy have to be designed so that it can take in these, uh, these insights, these informations that come out of the research, that come out of the data, and can effectively implement it into policy that works? I'm trying to, to approach it from a, from a different direction by also using data to measure the impact of a policy. Um, so when you develop a new policy and implement it, you can basically try to set up indicators in order to monitor was this policy or this new project or anything effective. And um, if it isn't, adapt, change uh, and do it. Um, I know that in, in Brazil, the city of Curitiba, they wanted to create a, a support in, in innovation and did several policies like reducing the, 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 t the tax on, on, on services. Um, creating some co-working environments in the city and things like that, and at the same time developed, uh, I think, an indicator set of 120 indicators or something like that, in order to really measure does this policy actually have an effect in order to, to adapt. So no matter what the policy is, it's really important to control for its outcome, again, using data, basically, to, 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 to monitor for it. And then... Um, if, but this is more wishful thinking, having looked a lot into climate change and so on, is that um, nowadays consumption in many, many areas is kind of free. We are, we are thinking a lot in flat rates today, using streets for free, using everything for free. One policy, of course, but maybe it's wishful thinking, is in, introducing a little bit more paper use. <laughs> Um, into the into the world again, may it be streets, may it be um, digital infrastructure, uh, may it be anything else. Because right now we have a, many many domains and the, the feeling like okay, we can we can consume a lot um, without consequences. So giving this idea to bring it a little bit more more in as well. Mm -hmm. Let me. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I just want to touch on one last thing and then we can move into in, into audience questions. I'm sure there's, uh, there's, there's a chance to, to deepen all of these things. But there's something that struck me um, when I listened to you here on this panel is that there's a bit of a trade-off maybe, right? Uh, Gary, you said the key here, and I couldn't agree more, is you have to understand the risk. And it stands to reason that the more data you have, the more analytical capacity you have, probably the better um, you are at understanding the risk instead of designing solutions. You're shaking your head already, that's great. Um, but at the same time, I think sort of one, one, uh, one aspect here, and, and, and I would love for, for Debjani to maybe briefly comment if we could get her a microphone, um, is to also give communities a voice and to make sure that there's a, there's a bottom-up part um, in these solutions and they're not just all designed from top-down. You made this great example um, you know, of these communities um, that needed to be moved or, or, or should, should, should have been moved because of the risk of flooding, but they also were a crucial part of the local economy and moving them away would have created problems on their own. So how can we think of the 
using all the, the top-down data, using all the, uh, the information we have, but still sort of empowering communities to be part of the solution. Yeah, that, this is this is a very uh, this is a very like a million dollar question again. But I think there is a lot of knowledge we are not tapping into, because some of these communities, for instance, in the uh, in the Bengal Delta communities, they actually know how to manage, uh, for instance, mobile spaces. They like a forest that is sometimes forest and sometimes water, and we can learn from them. And that 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 is something we cannot forget. And if you look at the historical data over and over again, you see that engineers who are working on ground are actually working with the people, the fishermen, the boatmen in these areas, trying to learn in the 19th century. So some of the things that we've realized is, you know, there are this, uh, the, there is a particular community of people called Choruas. They're very much like the floating people you see in uh, parts of uh, Vietnam and Indonesia. They move to newly formed alluvial flats. And they, they, they actually cultivated, these are very speculative landscapes. This is, their lives are quite violent. But they hearken back to a time when some of these, uh, they're saying now these um, uh, new alluvial flats are being made into protected property as floodplains, drawing very much from the Room for River project in the Netherlands, which is very, very important. We need, but, but they are saying, no, there used to be another mode of living, which is about temporary landscapes. During winter, let us use these spaces, these sand flats for markets and stuff. Let us move. There are ways of living in this kind of elastic method. So there are knowledges we can tap onto also, like not just empowering the community, but there are knowledge bases we can tap onto and to listen. Because mo most of the Sundarban people will say the biggest threat we face is political violence and electoral corruption, which then gets compounded when there is a um, uh, disaster. Because any kind of development aid that comes gets caught up in the corruption. And uh, of course, this is very, very hard. For instance, for an insurance company or a developmental ag agent or ADB or anybody to go back and regulate. But then the longer we ignore, the more compounded that problem is. And I think that's, that's something I don't know if there's a solution. But I can always, as a historian, go back and say that exactly happened in 1876 when there was a massive cyclone in Bengal. Many years, like that was one of the major cyclones in the colonial period. And we saw what it actually completely changed the land structure and wealth structure about how much corruption e entered the development in 1876. That's like almost 100 and so many years ago. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Superchai, I, I wanted to ask you, you showed us in your presentation um, this map of Bangkok uh, with the different zones and obviously, uh, you know, there was, I, I assume, some top level, uh, a top down um, decision making going on to decide which area is in which zone. Uh, but still, in, 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 all these, in all these processes that you managed, how did you ensure that sort of local populations, uh, that local communities uh, would be heard? What was sort of the participatory process for, um, for people, the people living in Bangkok to, um, to feed into to, to this decision making? Okay, uh, with this plan, we, do a lot. we have to listen to the people. So we have a public clearing, several public clearing mm -hmm. to, to show that, okay, uh, your zone is, is this color, this color, uh, and it cannot be shared easily. You have to go through 20 steps, 20 steps. For example, uh, people complain that, uh, okay, in each city we have a different zoning. For example, Bangkok is next to Tum Thani. And if, I, if Bangkok, the, the border of Bangkok is, is green, but Tum Thani is red. That means that if you move just one step to another city, you can build as very dense uh, area, but when you get into Bangkok, you cannot do because so people who live at that area in green, they complain. They say, why the next city is, is very dense, why in Bangkok is clean? That is very difficult to change. And every five years, we have to revise and we, we will look, okay, can we modify to let people develop more area and convert from yellow, which is uh, normal to orange, uh, a little bit denser or to red. Mm. So this is passed to the public participation mm. process. The city cannot do itself. It has to go through uh, everybody different stage. Thank you. So um, we listen to people. Yeah. Um, 
let's let's move on to some to some questions also from the audience. I already got quite a few um, submitted through Slido from the online audience. Thank you for that. Um, if you're here and you have a question, you can just um, raise your hand and, and and we'll get you a microphone. But let's start with one um, from the online audience, uh, and it's directed at you, Yona. So you you obviously know the case of Singapore very very well. Um, you live there. You spend a lot of time analyzing the data, sort of coming up with with solutions. Are there learnings? that we can derive from Singapore for other Asian cities like, like Bangkok and Kolkata. And it doesn't say here in, in, in the question, but I'm assuming it's also, Singapore is somewhat of a special case. Um, you know, it's obviously in many ways richer than, than many of its Asian peers. So I wonder to which extent can the solutions that work for Singapore work for, for, for other cities or how would they have to be adapted? I mean, the answer is yes. I mean, we are doing research and solutions that can be replicated in other cities. So the lessons learned that we have from Singapore are definitely of interest and can be also applied um, to other cities. And there are certain things that are not so different. Um, Singapore is very high dense. It's very densely populated. And I mean, Singapore is half of the size of the canton of Zurich and has 5.5 million, which is about people, and which is about three times. So you can see the density is about six times uh, higher than in the canton of Zurich. Um, I think I think what we definitely see is is this interaction between how science can provide information and how the authorities actually pick up the information. So we have a number of projects where in Singapore we go into the communities, we go into the into the city to actually demonstrate how we apply the different technologies or the different methods. We also do social uh, resilience and community resilience studies where we actually work with individuals in some parts of the city. So these methods and these approaches can be replicated in many other parts and we are also doing that actually to actually share our approaches and how authorities pick it up. But it's obviously a, a process and the process is critical. This is what the agencies in Singapore appreciate about, working over time with the academia to not just get a ready-made solution within one day, but see it as a process over time to basically collect information one by one, but not solving it just in one day, but seeing it as a challenge. And, and if I may just answer um, on the policy side, which Jan has brought up, um, this point about the policy. I mean, we have in Singapore uh, climate um, climate change targets, so like to reduce the CO2 uh, emissions by 30% by 2030, for example. At the same time, we are building roads. <laughs> At the same time, we are building EV um, cap capabilities. So there's a, there are many objectives that come out of the government, and it is our role as scientists to highlight these trade-offs. Thank you very much. Um, another, I think, very pointed question is, um, it's directed to you, Jan, but I'm sure Gary has, uh, has his thoughts on it as well. What are fast-growing cities mostly lacking from a technology point of view to properly analyze risk and resilience? So if you had to, if you could, if you could give one recommendation to Asian cities, what they should have that they don't have, what would it be? Oh, I didn't do a benchmark so far in Asian cities, but if we um, talk to cities, what we um, what we usually recommend is get the fundamentals right, which um, is do you actually have, with regards to technology, responsibility for data and for technology at the top of the city administration, at deputy mayor level or at mayor level. And these pre people should not only be responsible, with their teams should not only be responsible for um, providing IT services for the rest of the city administration, but for the impact of technology actually on the city and develop new solutions with other academia, with, with new partners. So it's about, um, it's about, when we talk about technology, it's about creating not an organization that offers more digital services, but a, a digital, ready organ, a digital ready organization, which requires the management to be digital ready, but also the organization. For example, a city like Helsinki developed a new course program, for which all, all 
um, lower and middle management and the whole administration had to get trained in the fundamentals of data science and AI to create the digital ready organization. And then last but not least, think about the citizens that they um, need to, because there are many citizens which might be at the risk of digital exclusion, that you also include them and offer them the infrastructure as well as the skills. So this is with regards to, to what we would recommend from a technology perspective, recommend a city to do more or less the inside job before for actually thinking about the concrete, concrete solutions. And with regard to resilience, I, I, I believe maybe um, Gary um, <laughs> might, have a, might have a more resilience-based answer than me. I don't know. <laughs> let's, let's put the question, Gary, what, what sort of capacities should cities build to be most resilient? What's the way, if they have a limited amount of money to spend, where is it best <clears throat> invested? I think first and foremost communication. And let, let's 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 people talk, right? I mean, first of all, climate change and resilience doesn't doesn't uh, obey. I mean, electoral cycles. So this this is not a four-year, five-year problem. This is a ten, twenty-year problem. I mean, be be brave enough to step back to to realize that it's it's a long-term issue, uh, and 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 and. That's number one, right? Not obeying electoral cycles, which which very often is a problem. I mean, we we are so often at the brink of of coming up with a solution uh, and then uh, re-election comes and then oh, we have to postpone it. Then after that, I mean, your new government is, is in charge and then, then it, it puts a, a big break on, on, on things. So communication. Uh, I also want to say there is a little, a, a touch too much talk about data and science. I appreciate it being a scientist myself, but also building on, on, the, on, the, uh, on the policy. It, it needs a will to move this forward, right? And it, it's, it's a very easy trap to fall into to say, oh, th there's not yet enough data. We need to know better. Uh, we are already at a 98% level, but let's get to 99, 99.5, et cetera, et cetera, six sigma in a way. It's, it's, it's fine, right? But, but let not the, the, the data hungriness and, and the seeking of, of ever more security prevent from starting actual action on the ground. Um, so yeah, talk to each other because I, I was really fascinated to see how much data and information actually is available just to have to bring this data to use. Mm -hmm. there's, there's, there's one thing I, I wanted to follow up on with regards to what Jonas has said in response to the, the, the first question of, you know, so can you apply the learnings from Singapore to other cities? And, and, and Jonas said, yes, of course, uh, there are many similarities. And, and Supershy, that led me to, to wondering, I'm sure as Chief Resilience Officer of Bangkok, um, you know, you, you've talked regularly to people who are, were in similar roles in other Asian cities, but is there or should there be you know, a more robust uh, body or organization that coordinates resilience policy across Asian cities? You know, on the obviously level of the nation state, we have organizations like ASEAN, but is there an, an organization that can facilitate the, the dialogue, the coordination, the communication, um, as Gary said, between cities to, to share best practice, to learn from each other, um, but to maybe also tackle certain things together. So that's, that's why the 100 resident city organization that's, that's occurred, because they try to gather and they create chief resident officer throughout the member city. Mm. Then, then the member city, each city who is the member, they have a chief resident officer and there's a network that from each other, they don't have to do the thing, repeat it again. So, so they can learn from success from other cities. For example, that we learn a lot from Rotterdam about the water and we learn from Mexico City. So we, we have a shared knowledge and uh, this, this, this thing that we have, but it's not the uh, government organization. So, uh, and unfortunately that, uh, the, the resilient is need, need the, the view from the leader. Sometimes you change the leader, you change the governor, you change the mayor, then they have some other priority to do, right? But uh, the, even, even, even though that we still exchange and learn from each other from the chief resident officer, but uh, in order to implement things, we, we do have communicate and we do, we do learn a lot each other so that that is the organization that that try to do and we have almost 100 city in the world mm -hmm. do that 100 resident city so in age 
and now you're gone again. <laughs> I think okay. I, 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 I think the, the, the Wi-Fi signal in Bangkok is um, is experiencing some issues. <laughs> um, uh, let, let, let me come back to you afterwards if, if there's still time. I do want to see. Um, we have maybe time for one more question from the audience. If there's one from the room, well, well, there's actually wow, three from the room. You guys should have put up your hands earlier. So let's collect the three questions very briefly, and then. Um, We'll do this magic trick where we answer all three questions in once. Uh, my, my question is, um, I don't know if this is live or not. It is. Um, Singapore has its Marina Bay barrage complex, many other things. Bangkok is much more sophisticated than I imagined. Having been there, I didn't know uh, it was so advanced. Um, Indonesia has given up in Jakarta because it's sinking into the sea and it's building a new capital. What lessons has it learned from the rest of Asia to make its new capital more resilient? Excellent question, thank you. And let's just move straight on to, I think we had one here and then another one here. Yeah, it's more about the pay for use or making sure that prices of goods and services reflect the carbon emissions. But I think the piece of that, so, so um, you know, I work at Zurich Insurance and we fully support that. But I think it's also like, how do you, how do we deal with the fact that that's going to really impact some certain segments of the population? I mean, it makes sense to change behaviors, but how do we protect, as we've been talking about well-being and everything, if we adequately show what the goods and services actually cost? Thank you very much. And then last question. May I? Yep. Yes. Okay. You may. Um, yeah. Um, so thank you very much. Um, I wanted to drill a bit more on the question of data, and we've been talking a lot about um, big data collected from traffic flows and so on. And I was just wondering whether um, there is a way to uh, incorporate into this anonymized data a bit more of a sort of, uh, I guess, um, social dimension, because there's a diversity of voices that is ideally involved into this process of. Um, democratic process of city planning and if these voices are not heard um, from the people say that are living in those danger zones along the rivers or so uh, there is a risk of tr constructing new risks right or new social issues so how do you cope with that maybe uh, Jonas Siri. Uh, so thank you Perfect. Thank you very much. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to take the liberty of, of assigning you um, uh, these questions. We have about eight minutes or so um, or so left, so I, I would ask you to be short. Jan, let me start with you, and I'm, I'm going to ask you the question about um, sort of integrating, integrating, um, I guess, carbon emissions or, or more broadly sort of external effects in, in, into pricing of goods, which you know, sort of from a, from a market economy point of view, is an unambiguously great idea. But it will make things more expensive, and that may negatively impact um, you know poor segments of the population. So how can we mitigate the sort of social effects of a sort of more transparent price structure that we want to move towards, but you know whose, whose social dynamics we also might want to. Uh, might want to curb a little bit. Yeah. Um, so I think it's very important to first of all recognize that the system as it goes is not really working because we don't have sufficient incentives to reduce carbon emissions and it's important to recognize and just put the energy in policy making towards what are really effective policies, even if they're uncomfortable for some people, they shouldn't be uncomfortable for everybody, but for some people to, to reduce it. The first step is recognizing that. And then the second, um, second part, I'm not, a, not, a, not an economist, however, what has been talked a, a lot recently is like about redistribution, of course, for those people who are actually most severely affected by it, but still having the usage of a service, of a very carbon incentive service must still be priced. So the person who is now very, very worse off gets like a compensation for that maybe, but still to use this service it will still be, be, mm. be expensive. So the person might think about redistributing the income to, towards something else. I think that's important. But then we should think about the whole thing as also from a more systemic perspective, I believe, thinking about transport all the mobility as a service apps we have nowadays which promise us to support green transport i'm not quite sure and i think a lot of research has shown they're not really working sometimes they're putting even more cars on the road because car transport is just too convenient it's not properly priced and so on if we would 
basically redistribute all the subsidies which go into streets and in car transport. And for example, invest them into biking infrastructure, invest this money also for um, redistributing the socially um, more disadvantaged. And in combination with a pricing system, like thinking about the whole systemic effects, then I believe there's a way to make a system which is um, at the same time more putting the incentives in the right direction towards climate protection and on the other side, which is also a fair system. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Jonas, the question to you was about, about big data. We need big data. We need to anonymize it for, uh, for privacy protection reasons, but we also need to sort of level a little bit so that we can actually derive meaningful insights from it. But that also means we, we, use, we lose some of the nuance um, that is inherent in the data because it comes from very different people. So how do you, how do you think about this trade-off and how do you try to manage it? I think big data is obviously now the big term. Um, AI and so on, it's, it's helping us to, to draw some conclusions. Um, but I think it has been said before, we, we need to consider that this is data that is from the past. We need to think about the future and the complexity of cities is more than just the past information that we have. So it's only a sub part of the reality that we can actually collect. So we need to be careful in over-interpreting um, this uh, information. And we, we are running into trouble if we rely solely on the past data. We know very well that we need to observe, keep on monitoring the present and in the future. Uh, forecasting is, is a very difficult uh, exercise. You can usually go wrong, or you usually go wrong, because you cannot include all parameters. I think maybe just answering the question that you brought up about how do we then combine the social and, 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 and the engineered or the system part? Um, I mean, my answer may not satisfy you, but I would say that the job for the authorities is to provide information to the people, to increase awareness. And typically you have a participatory-based approach. Um, in different contexts it, it runs differently. In Switzerland it's different than in the UK or in Singapore. But Definitely, you want to have an involvement of the people to see, look, if you're going to build a big road here, what does it mean for the community? What does it mean for, for the risk exposure? Are we building a road in the middle of a, of a marshland? I mean, these things need to be shown to the individuals in the communities, and they need to be debated, and they need to be discussed. But the choice and the decision then lies with the corresponding decision makers. Hopefully the communities are being heard. Um, I think we know about the value of intact and well-performing communities, how important this is to manage um, disasters. So this is well known. And the question then is, do you preserve it or not? Thank you very much. We've arrived at the last and sort of the it's a version of the existential question we've talked about before. So we talked about, you know, how can cities ad adapt and become more resilient? And Indonesia has found a somewhat radical solution, which is to pack up and leave and build a new one, which provides opportunity maybe to do some things better or the opportunity to make the same mistakes again. Gary, is that a good idea? Or maybe more precisely, what needs to be done? What does Indonesia need to do differently as they build a new capital for that to actually be a good idea? I mean, it's, it's just a sad fact, right? I mean, there is some of these slow, slow moving and uh, slow onset perils like sea level rise where, I mean, there is, there is, no, there is no adaptation, right? And, and mitigation might come too late. And I think it's good to, to just be, first of all, aware that this, this might be kind of like the outcome of a last resort. And th there's many, right? We have the, the Citizen Asia, but there's also some like the, the New York City airport, JFK runway, right? I mean, it's, it's not going, there will be no planes taken off New York runway, JFK, in 20, 20, 30 years from now, right? A storm surge today basically makes, makes downtown Manhattan an island, right? You need a, a rubber dinghy to go from Grand Central Station to, to the financial district, right? It's a fact. And it's also a fact that building a seawall around that will, will not do the trick because just cost prohibitive, right? So in, in that sense, yes, to have to move. And, and I think it's, it's sometimes risky to, to make that statement, but that, that's, I think that's a fact. And some of the islands, they will sink. It's, it's a fact. Though, though in, in that sense, um, to face it and then to, to learn from the past and, and to, find, to find places to, to, to go or to, to do things better. And I think all the recipes, I mean, came, came, came out through, throughout this morning, right? I mean, is it wise to build in reclaimed land? 
uh, consult the data and, and see, I mean, when we have sea level rises, I mean, there's so many tools and applications. There's also Swiss Risk CatNet. There's so many services you can go. You can check out biodiversity layers. You can check out, I mean, where the sea level rise is going to have the biggest effect. You can really have all the information about where is heat domes and heat islands to develop, et cetera, et cetera. You, you will know that glaciers are melting and that might be not available for irrigation or for power, power um, uh, production, et cetera, et cetera. So, put this information together and then take a decision, again, based on data and based on science, but maybe just simply on common sense and, and put, put certain economic short-viewed considerations aside. And I think that's, that's the challenging piece for me. And even in Switzerland, we have so many parts in the country where I mean, vacation homes or, or first, first homes are being built in avalanche zones, right? I mean, you look at the map, they are high, zones of high avalanche danger and we still allow folks to build there for some economic or whatever considerations. And, and we, have to, we have to do away with that. And, and if a local government can take the authority and the power to force that decision on the constituents, they should. I mean, that's what they're being elected for, that, that's what they are for. Though, uh, yes, I mean, it's not, not a direct answer to your question, but what can I say, right? I mean, if you move, I mean, move somewhere where it's smart to move, but it's just not an option for Jakarta to stay where they are today. Thank you very much. Um, I think you said something really important in there at the very end, which is putting short-term considerations aside. Sounds very simple, is incredibly complicated, um, but ultimately necessary to arrive at resilient cities. Um, we are very rapidly running out of time, so um, I would like to end it here. Thank you very, very much um, to our panelists, both here um, as well as in Bangkok, uh, Super Chai Tantikam, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Debjani Patacharya, for, uh, for joining us for the keynote as well. Of course, thank you all for having been here either in person or online today.